welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the past few videos, we've talked about the kinetics of chemical reactions, including both composite and elementary reactions, and the energies of those reactions. Today, we'll combine all that we've learned to understand one of the most interesting kinds of reaction that occurs in living things, enzyme-catalyzed reactions. As you probably know, an enzyme is a kind of protein that catalyzes a chemical reaction in a living organism. That means that it lowers the activation energy of the reaction, so even chemical reactions with a very high activation energy can still take place in a cell. For example, this chemical reaction is the overall reaction taking place during photosynthesis. It has an incredibly high activation energy of 15,144,000 joules per mole. That kind of energy is never available in a living cell, so a series of enzymes is necessary to lower the activation energy to something more manageable. Let's think a little about how enzymes work. A reactant that binds to an enzyme is called a substrate. In a typical enzyme-catalyzed reaction, substrate S binds to the enzyme E, forming an enzyme-substrate complex. The enzyme then catalyzes the reaction, which turns the substrate into a product Z. Finally, the product is released from the enzyme. The way I've written this series of reactions, it looks like there are three elementary reactions, each of which is a reversible reaction. But actually, we can make a few approximations that'll simplify this picture. First, the third reaction, in which the product dissociates from the enzyme, is extremely rapid, almost instantaneous. For that reason, we can treat the second two reactions as though they happen in one step, which gives us this. Another important simplification comes because the second reaction actually isn't reversible. The enzyme and product never recombine to give us back the substrate. That means the second reaction is an irreversible reaction in the forward direction. Finally, the third and most important approximation we can make is the steady state approximation. We talked about the steady state approximation back in video 4. If you've forgotten about it, you might want to refresh your memory before we move on. Anyway, the steady state approximation says that for a series of two consecutive reactions, if the second one is much faster than the first, then the concentration of the intermediate is nearly constant. That means that the rate with respect to the intermediate is nearly zero, because the concentration of ES isn't changing. Let's write out the rate law with respect to ES. From video 4, you hopefully remember that the rate law includes a term for each reaction that ES is involved in. So, for the forward reaction over here, we have the term K1 times the concentration of E and S. The reverse reaction causes the concentration of the intermediate to decrease, so that term will be negative K minus 1 times the concentration of ES and the last reaction will give us the term minus K2 times the concentration of ES. As I mentioned a minute ago, this will all be equal to zero because of the steady state approximation. It would be especially helpful and interesting to know how much of the intermediate we have. That is, how much of the enzyme has substrate bound to it. We could just solve this equation for ES, but the expression we get would have E on the right side. That's a problem because E is the concentration of free enzyme, that is, the amount of enzyme that doesn't have a substrate bound to it. And that's really difficult to measure. The enzyme-catalyzed reaction is so fast, we usually can't tell how much free enzyme there is at any one moment. So the first thing we should do is try to get an expression for E. That'll just re require a little algebra. The first thing we'll do is move the k1 term to the left side of the equation. I want that term to be a positive number, so we'll multiply everything by minus 1. Next, let's factor es out of the terms on the right side. And finally, we'll solve the equation for e by dividing both sides by k1 times s. Great! We now have an expression for E, the concentration of free enzyme, which can be a tough thing to measure. But remember, what we eventually want to get is an expression for ES, the enzyme substrate complex. In order to get a good expression for that, we need to eliminate E so that the equation will only have easy things to measure in it. So, 
how do we eliminate e from this equation? It turns out we can do it if we just remember that the total amount of enzyme in our solution is just a combination of the free enzyme and the enzyme that's attached to the substrate. So, in other words, E total is equal to E plus ES. If we plug in our expression for E into this equation, we get this. This may not look like an improvement, but this is actually very useful. Look at what this expression has in it. First, there's E total, the total amount of enzyme. This is actually really easy to measure. If this is a solution of enzyme we've made in the lab, we should know exactly how much total enzyme we put in the solution. The same thing is true for S. If it's a solution we've prepared, we should already know how much substrate we added. So E total and S are both things that we know. The different values of K are rate constants, which we can measure in fairly simple experiments. We'll actually measure the rates of some enzyme-catalyzed reactions in a lab experiment soon. So everything in this equation is easy to measure except for ES. If we solve the equation for ES, we'll be able to calculate the amount of enzyme-substrate complex, and that's a really useful thing to know, as we'll see in a minute. So let's just do a little algebra to solve this equation for ES. First, we can factor ES out of both terms on the right side of the equation. Next, let's make that term in parentheses a little simpler by making it one big fraction. We can do that by rewriting 1 as K1S over K1S. That means we now have two fractions with the same denominator, which we can add together. Finally, we'll solve the equation for ES by dividing both sides by the term in parentheses, which gives us this. So now, at long last, we have an expression for ES. I've been telling you that the concentration of ES is a very useful thing to know, so now let's find out why that is. Remember, here's our overall reaction. As with any reaction, we're most interested in how quickly the products are formed. So let's write the rate law with respect to the products, z. This is a pretty simple rate law because z is only involved in one reaction. The rate is equal to k2 times es. And now you can see why we did all that work to get an expression for es. If we plug it into our rate law, here's the equation we get. The important thing to notice here is that we have an expression for the rate with respect to the products, and everything on the right side of the equation is something that's easy to measure in the lab. All we have is E total, S, and a bunch of rate constants, all of which we can measure easily. One last thing. The usual way of writing this equation is by first factoring K1 out of all the terms. When we do that, here's our final result. It might seem like doing that has made this look more complicated, but it's made it so that all the rate constants are now grouped into just two places, here and here. Now here's why that was a helpful thing to do. In the numerator, K2 and E total are both constants for a reaction. That combination of constants is usually given the symbol Vmax. We'll see why that symbol makes sense in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, all the rate constants in this fraction are also constants for a given reaction, so we can give that its own symbol too, which is Km. This final equation is one of the most important equations in all of biochemistry, and it's called the Michaelis-Menten equation. The number Km is called the Michaelis-Menten constant. They're named after the German biochemist Leonor Michaelis and his collaborator, the Canadian biochemist Maud Menten. Both of these chemists had interesting lives and careers. For instance, Leonor Michaelis became the first foreign professor invited to teach at a university in Japan. It was at the University of Nagoya. And Maud Menten had numerous accomplishments, even outside of science. She was a skilled mountain climber, went on an expedition to the Arctic at a time when that region was still largely unexplored. She could speak six languages, play the clarinet, and was a good enough painter to have her work exhibited in a gallery. Anyway, 
let's see what the Michaelis-Menten equation can tell us. The main takeaway from this equation is that the rate of the reaction only really depends on the concentration of the substrate. Let's look at three limiting cases. First, suppose that the substrate concentration is really huge. In that case, Km will be very small relative to S, so the denominator is approximately equal to just S. In that case, the fraction in the equation is just equal to V max. If you remember what V max is, this tells us that the rate is approximately equal to K2 times the total enzyme concentration. So, in other words, when the substrate concentration is very large, the rate of the reaction just depends on how much enzyme is present. That means the enzyme is a limiting reactant, and that makes sense. Next, what happens if the concentration of S is very small? In that case, the denominator is approximately equal to just Km. Since Vmax and Km are both constants, we can write the rate law this way. This shows that when S is small, this is a first order rate law with respect to S. And finally, what happens if S is equal to Km? In that case, the denominator is equal to 2 times S, and the fraction simplifies to Vmax over 2. Well, that's enough new material for now. We'll explore enzyme-catalyzed reactions more during lab, and in the next video, we'll start a brand new topic looking at gases and the ways they behave. I hope you'll join me for that one, but until next time, have a good week!